The Thrydrongar Lighthouse, jutting out of the Atlantic Ocean a few miles from the Vespin Islands coast, just south of Iceland, is one of the most isolated lighthouses in the world, only reachable by helicopter. The name, translated from the Icelandic language, means three rocks, of which it sits atop the highest, and it is a great depiction of the often scenic and lonely lifestyle of a lighthouse keeper. Lighthouses are a lonely business, but historically have been a necessary one. Since their inception, lighthouses have always had two principal functions, to warn of danger from a spot sailors could see, and to be guides into harbors. In many instances, it was a matter of life and death, as well as having a profound impact on naval commerce. So keep your eyes on the horizon and I'll light the way as we learn something new. The first lighthouse on record was built on the island of Pharos. The Lighthouse of Alexandria, also known as the Pharos of Alexandria, would later be designated one of the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. It was one of the only structures of these seven built for a practical purpose, guiding sailors safely into the harbor at Alexandria, Egypt. Alexander the Great founded this port city on the Mediterranean Sea in 332 BC, and located it on the western edge of the Nile River Delta to avoid heavy silt and sediment loads deposited annually by the Great River. Ptolemy, ruler of Egypt after Alexander's death, authorized the building of the Pharaoh's Light in 290 BC. Alexandria served ships carrying Egyptian grain and armies to ports around the Mediterranean, and proved important to the extension and maintenance of the Roman Empire. The pharaohs of Alexandria stood for about 1500 years, finally falling victim to earthquakes in 1326 AD. The total height, including the foundation, had been about 384 feet. It was reported to have used fire at night and a sun-reflecting mirror during the day. The ancient Romans were huge fans of it, memorializing it on their currency. The Romans would go on to build lighthouses of their own, with wood fires blazing a light in the darkness. But after the fall of the Roman Empire, no new lighthouses were constructed until the end of the Dark Ages, when trade among ports on the Mediterranean and beyond began to expand. The Italians built a light tower in 1157 at Meloria, and at other port cities thereafter. Almost all of them harbor lights. It wasn't until the 15th century that lighthouses began to be installed to warn seamen of hazards to their vessels along the routes to the port cities. This practice would only grow as the Americas were being settled. The first lighthouses in the Americas probably consisted of small fires on hilltops or lanterns displayed from the windows of houses overlooking harbors. In the territory which would eventually become the United States, the Boston Light was the first structure generally accepted to be a true lighthouse. It was built in 1715 on Little Brewster Island in Boston Harbor and lighted for the first time in 1716. Though destroyed at the end of the Revolutionary War, it was rebuilt in 1783 and is still functioning today. In fact, the Northeast hosted the majority of the early lighthouses, given the more intensive marine time interest in merchant shipping and fishing in that region. The U.S. Lighthouse Service was established in 1789 as one of the first acts of the new federal government and took over responsibility for the operation of existing lighthouses and the construction and operation of new lights. Once again, the purpose of a lighthouse's light is to provide a mariner at sea with a fixed point of reference to aid his ability to navigate in the dark when the shore or an offshore hazard cannot be seen directly. The distance at which such a light can be seen depends on the height and intensity of the light. The brighter the light and the greater its height above the sea, the farther it can be seen. Of course, when the weather is bad, with rain, snow, or fog, visibility can be greatly reduced. The earliest light for lighthouses were wood-burning fires. Large, visible fires which required vast quantities of wood, which tended to burn quickly. During the early 1500s, coal began to be used for fires and lighthouses. Coal had the advantage of burning more slowly and more brightly than wood. However, it also required more care to keep its fire bright, particularly during bad weather. Enclosing the fire with glass windows resulted in soot on the glass, which reduced the visibility of the light. Candles were used in some lighthouses. Although not as bright as coal fires, candles produced less soot and ash and were more easily contained within a lantern, which kept the flames steadier. Some lighthouses used dozens or more candles and reflectors to make the light more visible, but in bad weather, still brighter lights were needed. Lamps burning oil were the next step in the attempt to improve the visibility of the lights. 
Across the Atlantic, Frenchman Augustin Fresnel developed the Fresnel lens, which would change the game for lighthouses going forward. The lens was able to bend the rays of light from the lamp in the center, concentrating them into powerful beams of light that allowed people to see it from significantly farther away. Their implementation into lighthouses was swift. Soon after its invention, it was widely reported that the Fresnel-equipped lighthouses were far superior in terms of illumination, and much more economical to operate than any other system out there. In 1851, after hearing the reports, Congress reorganized the lighthouse service and established a lighthouse board to administer the aids to navigation. It also directed that Fresnel lenses be installed in all new lighthouses, and in existing lighthouses whose lighting apparatus needed to be replaced. Within 10 years, all U.S. lighthouses had been equipped with Fresnel lenses. From there, many improvements followed. Whale oil was replaced with lard oil, which was replaced with kerosene. But in 1886, the Statue of Liberty lit up electrically illuminated arc lamps. For a variety of reasons, including the great expense of installing and operating generators and maintaining the early electric lamps, only a few additional lighthouses were electrified in the United States before the turn of the century. The potential advantages of electrifying lighthouses, however, drew increasing attention in the United States during the early 20th century. Adoption of electrical light sources remained slow, however, because many lighthouses were not conveniently accessed by power lines and it was not until the 1920s and 30s that those lighthouses could be provided economically with generators to supply the needed electricity. Once they were electrified, the lighthouses could be automated. The advantages of this were numerous. Electric lights were turned on and off by a timer switch, the clean nature of the light eliminated the need for daily cleaning of the lenses and maintenance of the lamps, and the mounting of multiple lamp bulbs allowed burnout lamps to be automatically replaced. The need for resident keepers could not be justified economically, as electrified lighthouses could be maintained by visits on a weekly basis. In 1939, responsibility for the U.S. aids to navigation was assigned to the U.S. Coast Guard, and the Lighthouse Bureau, which had succeeded the Lighthouse Board, was abolished. Since the mid-20th century, further technological developments have made visible aids to navigation increasingly less significant to mariners. These developments include the establishment of radio beacons in the long-range navigation system, which uses radio signals to let mariners know where they are, and the GPS, which relies on receivers that interpret special satellite signals to determine position within a matter of a few feet anywhere. Modern lighthouses still remain as monoliths, depicting our past, and although as technology improves their importance becomes less significant, the impact of the purpose they served can still be seen today. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing. I have a lot of plans to make my videos better than ever, and your support will help me realize those goals. So once again, thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.